Hello everyone and welcome to the MakerDAO Scientific Governance Service Meeting number 122 taking place on Thursday the 17th of December 1600 uh, UTC. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, my name is Long for Wisdom, did I say that already? <laughs> I did. My name is Long for Wisdom, I'm the Governance, Governance Facilitator for MakerDAO. Um, we've got the usual sort of agenda for the call, we'll have uh, updates from the uh, major groups, and then we've got a couple of segments um, from various people on sort of a year in review wrap up uh, things. So it should be good to get to. Um, a little bit of preamble first. Uh, feel free to interrupt or uh, make comments or questions. Um, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you, so feel free to, to chat. Um, all right, cool. So a couple of reminders, I guess, around um, this call uh, and the holidays. Um, so first of all, in January, in January, we'll be adjusting the time of this call back one hour. So we'll move to 17, 1700 UTC. Um, I think that's slightly easier to make for people in the US. East Coast, West Coast, one of the coasts, I think West Coast. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, obviously it'll be in the agenda, but yeah, West Coast, yeah, I, I don't kind of, not in the US, I, I don't know. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that uh, after in January. Um, comes into the second point in that this will be the last call of the year. Um, for the next two weeks, um, we're going to sort of uh, suspend the usual governance cycle um, given the holiday period. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be out of action, so it uh, makes kind of makes sense to call it for those two weeks. It also gives everyone a break, which is kind of nice because uh, people have been working hard. All right, I think I, that covers my introduction things. Before we jump into updates. Um, Lucas, do you want to say something brief? Uh, Lucas Manuel, that is, rather than the other Lucas. Yeah, that's confused which one you're referring to. <laughs> um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas. I'm on the Smart Contracts team at Maker. I'm a mandated actor as well. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell everyone that tomorrow will be my last day at the Maker Foundation and as a mandated actor. Um, had a great time working here. Um, I loved working here and, and uh, learning a lot from all of you guys. And uh, I, I am stepping down as a mandated actor. Hopefully in the future, I'll have enough bandwidth to come back and help out. Uh, but for the time being, I'll be, I'll be stepping down. So thanks for all the, all the good times. And I, I hope to stay in touch with pretty much all of you. So thanks. Uh, thanks for letting us know. Um, yeah, I sh share the sad faces in the in the chat. Um, and yeah, it's been great having you around. You've been awesome to uh, to chat with. Uh, anybody else want to say anything <laughs> on behalf of Lucas? <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll say something. Um, well, I, I was going to say it later, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Lucas, for everything you've done for the project. Um, I, I'll say uh, when we first interviewed Lucas, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people in my life. Um, and Lucas, uh, I, I walked in with like a sort of playbook of how I was going to go through the interview with Lucas. And he had already had like all the multi-collateral die code up. Like he was like running simulations through it and stuff. I mean, he just like, he blew the interview out of the water and um, didn't uh, didn't fail to disappoint after we hired him either. So um, uh, you've been super useful, probably uh, a bit of a unicorn when it comes to like finding somebody that like joins a team and comes up to speed and starts working on stuff. So it's a, it's um, a big loss, but uh, um, we wish you the best in your future endeavors. And I hope that you uh, find the time to eventually come back and and uh, help us see like, I don't know, 10 billion die or something. Yeah, thanks, Chris, that, that means a lot. I've loved working for you guys and it's been awesome. So thanks for that. Yeah, this is definitely a setback for the team, but uh, you've been great and uh, I, we wish you the best at the, the next thing. Thanks. 
Cool. All right, thanks, guys. Um, I guess with that, let's move into our weekly updates. Um, I guess start off with governance and governance at a glance. Uh, this week, um, uh, Pros11 has given me a hand in putting this together. Um, and we're going to see about maybe having him take over this segment in the future. Um, for the time being, I'll just uh, go through uh, the actual discussion, discussions and the signal requests we've had uh, in the last week. Um, so we had a pretty active discussion started by uh, Seb, at Seb Ventures, um, talking about, you know, sort of starting a brainstorm around um, how contributors uh, in MakerDAO should be compensated. Um, had a lot of, uh, obviously, a very important topic and had kind of a, some, a good level of engagement. Um, so I'd encourage people, to, if, if people are curious about that, either now or in the future, um, to, to give it a read over and maybe leave a comment on it with your thoughts. Uh, let's see. We had a, a piece from uh, El, Gres El Progresso or uh, Frank Cruz um, about the sort of on a similar topic um, <laughs> titled 2021 to Infinity, um, MakerDAO community owned and operated. Um, talking about how to sort of retain and attract talent as MakerDAO enters a new stage of, of kind of autonomy and growth. Uh, let's see, we had a thread from uh, Shane uh, pointing to uh, a shift that we've recently that we've just seen or just informed of um, in TUSD, uh, the ownership of the, uh, I think, I mean, the token at least, possibly the trust token company, not entirely sure. Um, so there's some discussion going on there. And we can maybe discuss this a little bit later if we have time, because I know a couple of people feel strongly about it. Um, and then we had some other uh, sort of largest dis discussions continuing. Um, Hexnotes, uh, Sam McPherson's uh, introducing DSS Gov rewards, continued to sort of see discussion. Um, and uh, as has the thread from Mago Crypto, um, proposing to launch Oasis on IPFS or a mirror of Oasis on IPFS. Uh, in terms of signal requests for seeking consensus, um, the vault compensation working group payment poll continues, uh, signal poll continues. I believe it's ending soon. Uh, two weeks. Uh, yeah, a couple, like another five days or so. Um, so again, I, oh wait, this wasn't the sort of fondest memory for many of us, but um, if you have opinions on on the payment of the working group, I'd encourage you to, to leave a comment and to vote. Uh, and then we had the, Signal request for the PSM parameters, which was on chain uh, this week and has now finished. I still haven't checked the results because for some reason I always forget each week, um, but I'm assuming it passed. It looked like it was going to. If any of you knows otherwise, feel free to correct me. All right, otherwise in governance, I think, um, so I, I talked about the documenting some of the governance parameters um, on and off over the last few weeks. Um, those documents are now live. Um, they're on the community development portal. They'll also be linked to from relevant polls, um, meaning that hopefully for users that are voting for the first time or aren't super familiar with the system, they can understand what, for example, the stability fee is, the debt ceiling is, um, like the, the dust parameter or the debt floor parameter um, or the surplus buffer. You can understand what these parameters are, uh, what they do, what they mean, um, and the trade-offs between changing them um, before voting. Um, also going to be sort of continuing to work on documentation, or well, maybe not, maybe not in the next few weeks, but in the new year, um, regarding some of the new things we're bringing in. For example, the PSM and the DC IAM. Um, had a couple of people asking how the uh, debt ceiling is internet access module works under the hood and what the what the gap parameter means specifically. Um, so I think documenting that will be useful. All right. Let's maybe move on to smart contracts then. Uh, Chris, you need to do smart contracts, smart contracts update. Hey, you're looking festive today. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, changed the Etihad out for something a little more appropriate. Um, so smart contracts team update uh, for last week. Uh, we finally saw the DS chief uh, 1.2 activated, which was great. Uh, so it launched um, my my palms have officially stopped sweating uh, simply, not just because we launched it, but also because we put the 
first executive through it. So we know that it, it, it's totally working. Um, so that was, you know, something that was a little bit unnerving. Um, but I can talk about it now since we're past it. So, <laughs> uh, so last week, the executive uh, included the DC auto line for FB and it included uni and ren BTC as collateral types, uh, as well as some uh, number of changes. I think what we set stable coins to zero and we added a, um, a, like an Oracle uh, approval for I think Wi-Fi's proxy. Um, so there, there were a bunch of stuff in there um, and, uh, and all of that went through and passed, which is great. And, um, and then so for this week, uh, we've been working on Ave, uh, Uni V2 uh, Di F LP tokens, and MIP21, which is real world assets. Uh, so to uh, so on that news, I mean this is this has been a, a pretty um, a pretty difficult uh, executive to try and get through. There's uh, one I think it's partly because it came on the heels of a major executive from last week, so we um, had to start late on this one. And two, just because, uh, you know, even like with the Aave edition, uh, I'm sure everyone saw the um, the smart contract bug that Aave had in their token. Um, so that uh, that's a little unnerving. Um, the LP tokens require a huge Oracle code update uh, in order to work. And um, that, that's been a little bit non-standard for us. And so that process is taking a bit longer. And um, what Will and I have been working on uh, MIP21 and uh, I, I regret to to say that um, I think we're going to have to push MIP 21 off to the next um, cycle. We're just not um, finished on MIP 21. Um, so I'm still uh, sort of, I got some of the deploy stuff working and, and um, we're still working on the test, but um, it needs, it still needs a sort of big kind of final review. And there's a number of tests that we still need to complete. So. Uh, it's just not quite ready this week, but I am pretty confident that it'll be ready for the first uh, round of executives next year. Um, uh, sorry to everyone who's been pushing on that really hard, but this one slipped. So um, uh, we still have the uh, DSS exec lib in review. None, none of us have looked at it yet, although I think we're gonna switch to using that next year. Uh, so that'll probably happen first thing before we do any like additional collateral deployments. Um, uh, there's no onboarding uh, work from our team. And uh, just in, in general, I wanted to thank, you know, Naz for the work that he did on Ave. I wanted to thank Will for the work that he did on MIP21 um, and Lucas for the uh, LP tokens and um, then Brian's the one constructing the spell, and I and uh, Sam, I believe, is still working on his implementation of the PSM. Uh, although you know we have no um, input into that, uh, everyone's been working really hard to try and like execute the end of the year. And so, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think I'm going to go over what we're going to do uh, next week, and so that's pretty much it for smart contracts. Since you know we won't reconvene until next year. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. All right, thanks for that, Chris. Um, see so Oracle's uh, Nick, do you wanna give us a quick update? Cool, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, apart from the things that, uh, that Chris Mooney just uh, just mentioned. Uh, we've mostly been working on the um, the Uniswap LP Oracle. Uh, you know, we, we've kind of had the the base code for it for for almost like uh, a couple months now, uh, but it's just kind of been adding the the scaffolding um, around it in in terms of the the admin uh, kind of functionality, um, and then more recently, uh, kind of the uh, there's a there's there's a fee that Uniswap has that that isn't turned on right now, and it's not it's not a trading fee, it's kind of a, a protocol fee, and it's kind of deducted from uh, whenever you mint or burn kind of a uh, LP tokens, right? So when you're whenever you're adding or removing liquidity uh, to one of the pools, right, it siphons off uh, 
um, if, if the fee is turned on, it siphons off like 0.05%, um, which uh, we, we kind of had a back and forth for a little while if it's even worth kind of implementing this, uh, this, this 0.5% thing, because it really doesn't, uh, even when the fee is turned on, it, it has such a minimal effect on the LP token price that the much more relevant thing, right, is the fact that, uh, you know, you, uh, in an OSM like environment, right, where you have the one hour kind of Oracle security module delay, uh, you have much more slippage from uh, what well, kind of kind of price uh, diff slippage, just from uh, just from waiting, right, that uh, that one hour time period than you ever would from, you know, this 0.05% fee being turned on or off. Um, ultimately, we kind of did settle in the direction of like correctness. Uh, so we, we did end up, uh, implementing it, um, but, uh, which, uh, to, to an extent is, is not ideal because we usually we want to code freeze things kind of, uh, a while before, uh, we, we put them into production. Uh, but the change is, is fairly minor. It's basically just like an, if kind of branch off of the regular, uh, kind of happy path. Uh, so it, it, it should probably be fine. Uh, that being said, right, uh, anytime you uh, deploy new contracts, especially ones that have the complexity that the, uh, that the new Uniswap LP token has, uh, it, there's always risk um, attached, right? Um, so not only do we have, right, the regular collateral risk, but now we have kind of significant uh, smart contract risk. And, and that smart contract risk, right, is not... Uh, like, you know, we, it's not like a, it's a surprise to us, right? We, we knew going in that, that this would be the case and hence why the, the debt ceiling, um, why, why we recommended that the debt ceiling should be uh, fairly low um, to start, right? So I, I'm excited that uh, tomorrow we get the first uh, LP pair in and, uh, you know, uh, early next year, I, I would hope that we get uh, a bunch more of the other ones in like USDC ETH, wrapped BTC ETH, uh, and, and a couple, a couple of the other, uh, high, high liquidity pairs. Um, and, and it even applies to the, uh, to the sushi swap, uh, pairs as well. So if there's, uh, some high liquidity pairs there as well, uh, this, this all translates over, uh, but at least to start with, uh, we'll have kind of the debt ceiling, uh, really crippled, uh, for the first one. And in effect, this will just act kind of like a, a bounty almost, right? Uh, so if, if there is some kind of uh, exploit in the Oracle contract, right, someone should go and exploit it, right? And uh, we, we can only kind of lose up to, uh, up to the, the debt ceiling. Um, yeah. So uh, that's, that's kind of the, the state of things. Um, you know, now that we've uh, delivered on the, the LP stuff, we're uh, basically going to start taking a closer look at the real world asset stuff. Um, so that's going to be our priority kind of going into, going into the next year. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, anyone, any Oracle related questions? All right. Looks like not. Uh, let's move on to risk then. Uh, Primish, do you want to give us a risk overview? Yeah. Uh, so, in regards to collateral evaluations, uh, so far we managed to perform all of the evaluations that were planned. Uh, TBTC is still missing, but it's actually currently in final review, so uh, it should be actually released soon. Uh, we're also looking into collateral priority spreadsheet to decide on which assets to evaluate next. It seems that the highest ranked collaterals are liquidity mining uh, based tokens. Uh, but this probably means we should first have yield farming feature implemented um, if we truly want to attract some demand uh, to this, for this kind of collateral. And this is why we started uh, working more intensively on CUSDC, crop join risk assessment. Uh, we're actually currently making uh, simulations on, on the parameters that were already proposed for CUSDC, um, particularly how would, uh, you know, 10% stability fee or 110% liquidation ratio, how would this play out once we start supplying uh, you know, larger amounts of USDC in compound? And uh, yeah, I hope we can get risk assessment ready until the end of year. 
so we can start onboarding uh, this kind of yield farming assets uh, early next year. Um, we're also assessing the situation with the TUSD. Uh, there was a discussion uh, uh, on forms whether we should start reducing uh, the exposure to, to USD uh, after this recently announced uh, acquisition from some, yeah, I think that a bit of unknown Asian, uh, Asian investors. Um, here, uh, I noted in the forums, and I want to note once again, that we will be mitigating this potential risk already uh, tomorrow, potentially, if PSM uh, vote uh, passes, uh, because the, the executive vote that's also included is to set uh, debt ceiling on current stablecoin vaults to zero. Um, so this should be somehow mitigated. Uh, but I personally also think that there's no, no real reason to rush at this point, um, because we still might see some of those vaults uh, unwind on their own. Um, although I still think we need, uh, the, it's worth having a discussion about how we could uh, potentially reduce exposure to, to, to TUSD and prepare some kind of plan, um, you know, whether uh, having some kind of controlled liquidations or um, uh, selling, collateral, uh, selling collateral directly by the protocol uh, remains to be seen. And uh, yeah, finally, in regards to our other work, um, we are lately working also on improving uh, our value risk models, uh, which are actually being improved to start, start accounting for correlations uh, between collateral assets. That's something that we actually missed in the past. Uh, and this should uh, provide governance a good input to start assessing how well the current surplus buffer actually protects us against uh, certain tail events. And uh, we got really huge help from Andy, who is another known uh, member from forums. He was very helpful at, uh, helpful at improving the old valid risk model, and we should have some results soon. Um, additionally, there was also one, one other nice tool released this week by another community member, um, Prabhav, I think uh, is his name. And uh, the tool he developed uh, it's really cool. It provides uh, monitoring of DAI liquidity and DAI flows between larger uh, addresses that he was able to whitelist. And uh, yeah, it basically helps us assess the state of DAI markets and DAI, DAI holdings. Um, so I suggest you take a look at it. And that's basically it from our side this year. If you have any questions. Uh, there was a question from Pros in the sidebar um, asking, uh, do we have an ongoing review process for approved collaterals or is it, is it up to the DAO to act if something changes? I'm um, not sure if I understand If There's an ongoing review. So is, is this meant for the collaterals that are already onboarded? I think so, yes. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer this. I think it's mainly asking, like, you know, do we kind of monitor the developments with the current collateral types, right, and potentially change things if they need to be changed? Well, we do. I mean, we do measure liquidity and assess the risk premiums and debt ceilings. If this was the question, um, so when we did the, the rate setting, we actually published the dashboard, the the spreadsheet where risk premiums were updated and debt ceilings, and we plan to do this, I think, on a monthly basis. Um, and yeah, provide some, um, pr propose some changes to specifically debt ceilings and interest rates. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, it's just a regular on, on collateral onboarding process or if there's something urgent of the sensors. Hey, Primoz, and um, hypothetically, if you had to delist, if we had to delist, uh, one of the collaterals, has there been a risk analysis with regards to such if you had to do an emergency delisting? Mm, so far, we didn't had such, such an example, but it's, um, I mean, it's a good question how to perform it. I mean, ideally, you, you lower the debt ceiling to zero, um, then we need to have some kind of liquidation plan. Um, but there was no such occasion yet. I guess we could have a framework how to do it in place. It's a good point. Got it. And um, with regards to USDC, are 
Are we looking at doing another uh, debt ceiling um, lift? Um, so the plan is to reduce the debt ceilings on current stablecoin wallets to zero, right? And then the PSM debt ceiling, which will include initially only USDC, um, has a debt ceiling of 500 million, which was voted. Uh, and then, I mean, Sam should should comment on it, but the idea was to just start with USDC, but then next year we start implement we start uh, including other uh, stable coins into PSM. And uh, if you want to create some kind of diversification, we would limit the USDC one and decrease the the debt ceiling on on other ones. So we force the the diversification. Got it. Cool. Thank you. All right. Maybe maybe that's a good time to, to get Sam's update on the PSM. Yeah, we were just talking about it. Uh, Sam, do you mind just going over what the plan is, I guess? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we've got a little bit of a new situation this week in that there is going to be a community executive vote in addition to the regular Friday executive. Uh, so I'm going to be putting together the community run executive. And uh, the idea is to uh, deploy them both at the same time, but have the uh, portal list the regular executive done by the Maker Foundation uh, on Friday as normal wait till that one passes and then uh, add the PSM executive. So included in that PSM executive is also the changes to the debt ceiling. So uh, most all the stable coins, except for uh, uh, USDT and the USDC uh, B vault will be going to zero and the PSM will be added with a 500 million debt ceiling. Uh, so that's all good to go. Uh, still waiting on the audit. Uh, I'm hoping it will come in today uh, or tomorrow. Um, so I'll be posting an update for that as soon as I get it. Um, but yeah, all systems are go as far as I can see. Is there any questions about this process? More just procedural. So how are you adding it to the, the voting portal? Uh, so it'll be added just the same, but we, we want to do the, uh, we want to have the uh, regular Friday executive pass first and then list the next one, uh, the PSM executive. So uh, whenever it passes, you know, maybe it's Monday or something like that. Uh, it's also uh, worthwhile to mention that we'll run it with a longer expiry because uh, we're planning to run it over the, uh, over the entire holiday break because we don't have any other executives coming in. So We'll give it a bit longer of time to pass because there may be less availability of people. Uh, so I don't know when that's going to pass, but uh, yeah, that's that's the idea. And I guess Sam, you, we're going to need a push from the community, right? Because um, I don't see any uh, VCs jumping in. Uh, so have you? What, what's the hat at right now? I'm sorry, I haven't looked at it. It's about eighty thousand. Uh, Does anybody know? Sorry. 60, 70,000. Like 62 I last I checked, I think. Oh, I'll tell you in a sec. Uh, 63,000 is on the hat. Got it. So we're going to need like 63,000 uh, community members. <laughs> All right, cool. It's, it's going to be good. Yeah, I'm excited. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah. Uh, as Sam said, that will just show up on the portal, um, like any other executive um, from like voting perspective, it should look exactly the same. Um, so yeah. All right. Let's move on. Um, so let's see. Community development and operational support. Uh, Amy, do you have any updates to give to this week? Yeah, I thought that um, we'd do a little bit something fun. So let me just share my screen really quickly. 
Um, so since we're coming, uh, so Charles and, and Guy will actually go through a little bit more like high level um, year in reviews. And I just thought I would give like a little um, fun, positive note of uh, activity. So uh, one of the great things is we had some really great calls this year, um, community collateral calls that Juan has been running. We have community calls that um, David and, and actually like uh, extended hosts have been um, running and then obviously these governance and risk calls. And then we have um, the community that's been creating maker relays, which are summaries of all the different um, activities and governance for governance uh, to see. Um, we had, this is not an exact number. There's actually probably more, it's around six working groups. Um, and I think this is the one that I really wanted to share with everybody, um, forum activity. I, I think we use the forum as a lot of the communication that goes happening happens in governance, but it's um, very rare that we actually see what kind of activities. So I did a little digging through. And um, starting with how many likes, we had 25,900 uh, total likes. So everyone's uh, participating in, in, um, in posts that they, they're liking. And one of the things is um, this is a, a total the total user daily visit is a long-winded word of saying every day um, the number of users that are visiting. So it's at a whopping uh, 37K um, and that's up 800 and, um, 582% from last year, which is awesome. And the exciting thing is the new user signups. So people who created new accounts, um, we only had 484 last year and this year we had 1,700, which is up 350%. Um, this is the most impressive one. Uh, we had 12,000 new posts this year compared to um, 1,500 last year. So that is incredible growth as well as um, the number of topics, new topics that were created. So um, these are just like some brief overviews I want to leave uh, just with some fun statistics. Um, I'll be doing kind of a, a wrap up that I'll share in the forum. Um, but. Thank you to everyone who's been contributing to the community members to um, to to long for wisdom the governance facilitator for managing the craziness of the forum as well um, and onward for next year it's going to be great and that's it for me yeah thanks amy um yeah i'll just say those are slightly terrifying numbers from my perspective it's the person who has to moderate the forum um so <laughs> if anybody's interesting interested in forum moderation as a role going forward, let me know. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we've definitely seen seen some growth over the last year. Cool. Uh, all right, um, Juan, do you want to give us an update on uh, the collateral calls uh, that have been going on recently? Yeah, absolutely. So yesterday we had uh, the last collateral call of the of the year we did the wrap up for for real world assets um, i'm going to to post the link in the in the chat in a, in a second but we basically had three asset originators um, so it was harbor trade credit people's company and fortunafy the three of them are working with centrifuge to to bring real world assets into the into the blockchain so it was quite uh, quite interesting unfortunately we did not have enough time to explore each project uh, in depth. So I don't know, maybe we'll have to invite them uh, next year to do a more specific for, for each one of them um, session. Uh, but yeah, the, the YouTube video is already uh, online. Amy posted it, uh, thanks for that. And yeah, the other thing that I wanted to, to comment on was a little bit what uh, Amy already said. Uh, I think we had uh, around 30 projects uh, presenting. So it was, looking back, it was, it was a little bit, uh, it was quite rewarding to be honest. Uh, I wasn't expecting that uh, too much when, when I started getting a little bit more involved into Maker. And yeah, I, I think that People here are, are too smart and, and hence too humble to, to say it. So I guess that I'll have to say it, but uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know a lot of you more and uh, seeing your work. Uh, it's, been, it's been really, really good. I'm not going to start giving out names because 
don't know, there's a good at least 15 to 25 people that uh, I've been enjoying working with and, and seeing your point of views uh, in different meetings. So it's been great. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for that. How's that for a speech long? Yeah, it was great. It was short. I liked it. <laughs> um, yeah, Brian makes a good point in the sidebar. Uh, Juan is most definitely one of those smart and humble people. Um, so please do embarrass him with your uh, congratulations and gratitude when you get a chance. Thank you. All right. Um, cool. So normally we'd have MIPS here, but maybe we just have Charles do um, his MIPS slash uh, Clash onboarding review presentation next. I don't know if you have separate ones, Charles, but I'm guessing not. Yeah, I, I bundled it all together to, for efficiency purposes, of course. No Just worries. Share my screen. Oh, I need yeah, that. Yeah, 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 there you go. All right, so this is the last weekly MIPS update for the year. Uh, it's been an amazing year with a lot of progress, as you'll see a little bit later. But before I get into the fun stats, I just wanted to mention that there's two new proposals in the conception phase. So they will be transitioned to the RFC phase, just making some comments on the, the proposals uh, in terms of the format, the structure, and um, just so it's more in line with the typical technical MIP template that uh, MIP0 has provided. But the first one is MIP31, and it's for Active Reserve AMM, aka DSS ARA. And it's a technical proposal for an active reserve based on uh, the Uniswap V2 contract. And then there's also MIP32, which is the PSM for compound mixed exposure. And this proposal uh, proposes to provide an extension for the PSM basically extending the PSM to leverage USDC uh, via DAI and CDI. So it also converts this USDC to CUSD using the same join adapter, uh, key lending join. And these two proposals were proposed by uh, Alexis. We have eight proposals in the request for comments phase. And um, I've gone over them a couple of times already, but there's a few new ones that I have yet to mention. And those are the sub proposals for domain team onboarding for smart contracts. And that is uh, Sam M, which is really awesome to see. And additionally, a risk onboarding proposal from Sev Ventures uh, to onboard himself as a facilitator for risk as well. And we also have the proposal to onboard Juan as uh, the domain support facilitator uh, to work with Amy, who was onboarded last governance cycle. And the all the other usual ones, so the DSS. DSS Gov, so the smart, the governance contract redesign, the PSM, of course, and um, the 30, the farmable CUSD adapter crop join. And we have the governance communications declarations of intent. And if it were to pass, it would uh, display the intention of MakerDAO to onboard or welcome a proposal from a govern governance communications uh, domain team. And lastly, we have the maker protocol uh, cover with Nexus Mutual, which is also a declarations of intent. So if that passes, uh, MakerDAO would welcome a proposal for uh, Nexus Mutual to cover the maker protocol. The premium discussions that are constantly uh, being talked about are the throttled surplus buffer, a tactical proposal, the delegation of authority, real estate tokenization of protocol, and uh, the PSM based on CDI. In terms of our collateral onboarding updates, we had last week three governance polls for collateral onboarding that all passed. So for Aave and then Uniswap LP tokens for USDC and ETH and DAI ETH. The executive vote to onboard Uni and Ren BTC went live on December 11th, last Friday, and executed on the 14th, adding them both to the Maker Protocol. We have five collateral types awaiting an executive vote. Uh, that's the RWA1, aka Success, Ave, the Uniswap LPs for USDC and ETH and DAETH, and then PAX G. And as the other 
domain teams mentioned, we'll be seeing the executive to onboard Ave and uh, Uni V2, uh, the DIETH LP token tomorrow. And lastly, we have the community greenlight polls for December. We're published on Monday and we'll be running until December 28th. And this is for the DPI, so the index and wrapped Filecoin and uh, the wrapped Zcash. So go and vote and uh, provide your input on those over the holidays. And that is this year's wrap up for cloud onboarding updates. So I wanted to get into some stats about the progress we've made over the past, uh, well, seven months, uh, which is pretty incredible. We've seen 20 collateral types onboarded to the Maker Protocol. Uh, as you can see, we had ETHB, Wi Fi, Balancer, GUSD, Uni, Ren BTC. Uh, oh, I repeated Uni there. Um, so 19. And I'm not going to list all of them, but it's been incredible to see the cloud onboarding process just evolve the way it has through community feedback and iteration with the domain teams. And it's really pleasing to see. And lastly, we have two more to be added by the end of the, the year, and that's Ave and then the Daith LP token for Uni. And just a pretty crazy stat that I wanted to share as well is we've seen 78 MIP6 applications for collateral onboarding. Um, and I imagine there's going to be a lot more in 2021. And lastly, I wanted to give some MIP stats as well. Uh, from the launch in May to now, uh, we've seen quite a lot of progress from the community. And so we've seen 33 MIPS proposed, 28 of them have been accepted and we have four in progress. Uh, the sub proposals, we have seen 44 come through, 37 accepted, and we have five more in progress. Um, so yeah, at the very least, decentralization is so hot right now. And um, I've been speaking to a lot of other community members to see these new proposals and ideas come through the premium discussion phase and uh, the forums have been as, act as active as ever. And we're gonna have a really great 2021 for uh, making governance and the maker protocol that much better. So with that, I just wanna leave it off with happy holidays. And uh, this is the end of my bit for the year. So thank you everyone, uh, really excited. And um, I'm gonna pass it off to, I believe, Guy. And that's me. Hi. So I am just going to drop a link. So can everyone hear okay? Yeah. Yeah. Do you maybe want to introduce yourself quickly, Guy? I know there's some sure. people who might not know who you are. No, no, no. Probably um, quite a few people don't. Uh, so my name is Guy Brandon. I work with the Marcoms team. I came on sort of more informally at the beginning of the year and uh, a little more formally uh, a few months back. And uh, I mainly work on the blogs at the moment. Uh, so I've just dropped a link in to our annual review uh, there, which is uh, much more detailed. But what I'm going to do is just give some very uh, edited highlights, a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, sort of developments and um, uh, just just a few things that are of uh, interest as a whole to the maker ecosystem um, and a few that are of particular interest to uh, governance. Um, so I won't take long. I'm just going to whiz through just a handful of um, sort of my favorite points here. Um, so obviously it was a pretty rough year, but um, it was an absolute Rubicon year for crypto and DeFi. And um, I think arguably MakerDAO was the largest beneficiary of that. Uh, so if we look at uh, the beginning of the year, multi-collateral DAI was uh, just a little over six weeks old. Um, and within about three weeks, the amount of DAI had uh, reached the 100 million mark, although that was mostly legacy SI. Um, obviously, that, uh, that changed pretty dramatically later in the year. So we know that DeFi has been a huge driver of DAI adoption, but what we've also seen is DAI sort of finding a niche in various different sectors. And uh, you can take a look at the blog posts about the Dai Gaming Initiative um, that launched in March. Um, but one of these sort of key use cases we've identified is that Dai is a, a really attractive um, currency for gamers for various reasons. Um, and another one is that we have seen uh, Dai gaining traction in the NFT space, which is obviously growing extremely fast at the moment. 
a um, lot of digital art um, and other collectibles, but it's it's sort of carving out a role as um, the currency for the digital art and, and culture market, which is pretty cool. Um, coronavirus uh, pandemic, obviously that's brought some uh, very heavy volatility across the global markets in March, uh, including crypto. And that market downturn um, served to prompt a number of community discussions around various improvements to the Maker Protocol, um, which have uh, come about in the following months and uh, will we'll continue. But there have been a few um, sort of immediate and medium term changes. So the liquidation system uh, is one of the big ones. Um, we obviously saw uh, Liquidations 1.2 launched in uh, September. That was uh, an important upgrade. Um, hey Guy, uh, um, I'm just going to pause you. Uh, are we supposed to be seeing any slides? Just want to check. No, no, no. I okay, um, I haven't had time to um, time to prepare any visuals, so I'm sorry. You just get my face. Um, in the context of major upgrades, um, I think we can also uh, include the DS chief um, upgrade that we saw very recently to uh, mitigate the risks of flash voting. Um, and it's also worth mentioning the uh, voting portal upgrade, uh, which obviously made it so uh, a lot easier for, for people to vote. Um, and then through the year, um, this process of decentralization that was already well underway has continued and accelerated. So at the end of March, um, there was the transfer of uh, MKR token control to governance. Um, and the big one was the approval of the MIPS framework in April, which was a massive step forward for decentralization. Um, and I think some of the, you know, some of the things that people have already uh, shared sort of show that, that that confidence was was not misplaced and the community has been uh, pretty much completely responsible for changes to the protocol since. Um, June was when DeFi adoption really started to accelerate and then July saw that spill over to the Maker Protocol. Uh, and that's when we saw uh, total value locked TVL and die generation really take off. Um, so TVL in DeFi has increased 2000% this year. Uh, and the big milestone for DAI was reached five weeks ago um, when the amount of DAI reached uh, in existence uh, reached a billion, which is a, a pretty cool milestone. And uh, check out that infographic uh, on the blog if you haven't already. Um, well worth mentioning uh, Ethereum 2.0, which officially launched a couple of weeks back. And that's gonna be a very long process obviously to uh, complete that set of upgrades to the network, but that is going to have um, pretty huge implications for uh, Ethereum um, maker and uh, DeFi as a whole. And then the last thing uh, it's worth mentioning is that um, that vote tomorrow, uh, it's going to go live tomorrow uh, around uh, real world assets, which is obviously uh, that's just unprecedented and another very cool development. Uh, so a few key stats. Thank you, um, Amy, for yours. But this is just, uh, these are just, again, some edited highlights. So over the course of this year, or since uh, roughly this time last year, we have seen the dye supply increase around 15 times. Um, we have nine times more collateral types. Um, there is a mistake on the blog, which I'm going to get them to update because we uh, finalized that text before um, that last vote uh, was approved. TVL is up uh, almost eight times. We have six times the number of volts. And last one is that the number of integrations has almost tripled. So all in all, it has been a pretty impressive year. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, great, thank you, Guy. Um, just quick correction. Um, the the real assets uh, spell has been pushed to January. Um, Chris, Chris went over earlier, um, but yeah, so it won't be tomorrow, unfortunately. That's fine. Um, all right, I think that brings us to the end of our scheduled agenda. Um, so that leaves the next sort of twenty minutes or so for uh, for Q and A and discussion. Um, so if anyone has any questions um, about anything in this meeting or anything in general. Feel free to chime in now.
All right, maybe not a lot of questions uh, right now. Um, yeah, maybe we can discuss uh, TOSD a little bit because I know that's been kind of a hot topic on the forum recently. Um, so I guess just to give a sort of overview of what we're talking about, um, I think it was yesterday. Uh, I'm just saying the day before. What's the thread now? There it is. Uh, yeah, so a couple of days ago, yeah, two days ago, um, Shane posted a thread um, looking to an announcement from the TUSD team um, talking about how the ownership of TUSD would be had been acquired by a, uh, by another group. Um, and that they would be sort of uh, taking over. Well, I say taking over, running it. Um, apparently, the existing team is gonna is gonna stick around to run TOSD, um, but they'll have different owners. Um, the CEO um, from Trust Token, uh, Raphael, left a comment in the forum as well on the same thread, um, sort of kind of reassuring uh, users that there wouldn't be any serious changes. Um, so yeah, there are definitely a couple of comments on that thread. So if anyone has thoughts or wants to kick off a discussion, uh, please do. Has anyone figured out who the uh, Asian consortium is at this point? Uh, it, it's Tron. They just use that as like a cover. Yeah, I will say it's not obviously entirely clear, but yeah, there was there was like similar language used when uh, the same consortium acquired Poloniex and the exchange, and which did market sharp kind of increase into a kind of Tron related content on that site. Yeah, uh, just if we do want to take the route of uh, unwinding exposure, there's kind of two ways we could do that. Uh, one we could uh, wait for liquidations 2.0 and just turn them on. Uh, that would work. Uh, another alternative is that we could liquidate uh, the current TUSD vault into the TUSD PSM uh, when we add that in uh, and, and then maybe set the T out fee to 0% to clear it out as fast as possible. Yeah, although I think it would still stay on the books. I mean, there, there's probably an alternative liquidation where we create a custom liquidator uh, that can be called. Um, it gets the the collateral. Uh, that liquidator then cycles it on the market for something like USDC or GUSD or PAX USD, and then puts that into the PSM, um, getting the die back and and paying the position. Except if we do that, then uh, whatever delta exists on the market for those pairs is going to be accrued as a loss into the, um, into the collateral buffer. So, or the, you know, the system surplus buffer. So those, those are options that, you know, we're not yeah. without options. It's worth, I think, mentioning that, that any option that involves liquidating um, all the vaults in the TOSD thing potentially upsets a subset of users, right? Like, um, like, although we kind of assume that those vaults have been abandoned, and presumably some of them probably have, uh, there's a good chance that some of them haven't, right? And some, like, especially now the stability fees are zero percent, like, there's a good chance that some of the creators of those vaults are just holding them and waiting for a uh, die to decrease below one. Uh, is, is it possible to turn on stability fees so that the large ones are under 101% at least? I mean, Almost they're all, the they're entire under, thing. Yeah, under yeah it's like 51 million of TUSD is already underneath the collateralization ratio. So almost the entire lot can be liquidated. Oh, so those users really wouldn't have much reason to be upset. Well, they might be because they they knew that there were liquidations were not enabled when they set up the vaults, right? Like, it probably, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll be fine, but like, I would expect someone at least to be annoyed if we just turned them on without any warning, right? Yeah, uh, we would definitely need to sort of give fair warning for that. But uh, I mean, we are going to need to introduce a stick at some point uh, to these vault holders. Otherwise, they'll just hold at 0% fees indefinitely and just get like a no risk short position on die. 
it, there's there's really no economic reason to come back for that at this point anyways uh if they if they unless they buy die for a very low price which we haven't seen in months i mean they're using leverage there right so if even if there's a small dip below one like that's multiplied like 50 times that's potentially money that they want right Yeah, I mean, in general, I think what we should probably do is give a fair amount of warning and create just a custom liquidator in the next year that, you know, lets people know, um, okay, this is going to start liquidating people. And as it liquidates them, it just moves those positions over into the PSM. Uh, they can top up or pay their positions down if they need to. I think that's the right approach. Um, and then it lets them keep their short position if they want. Otherwise, they have to you know, pay it back. Um, I just wanted to say that as a general tool, um, since we're dealing so much with stable coins, it would probably be very useful to have a, um, a flipper module that just sells um, stuff at a, at a DS value provided price um, that we could swap in in situations like this, where basically governance would just say, okay, well, we're happy to get rid of this um, to USD or whatever at, um, you know, one basis point below a dollar or something, and then just put that on and wait and see how long it takes to clear. Um, it's basically kind of like a PSM for liquidations sort of sort of thing, and it would just be a very simple thing to implement as a, as, as a flipper compatible with the existing interfaces. That's a good point. Um, one thing, like, I mean, that maybe hasn't been discussed is like, I mean, so I know Primrush had, was sort of, um, you, you posted in that thread, Primrush, I think, and uh, actually, no, you didn't post in that thread, but yeah, like, do, do you have any thoughts, I guess, on, on this issue? What might fit as an issue? No, I just, I just thought that there, there's no need to rush, like, today, but, you know, we need a plan. Um, I could personally think that. There still might be some unwinding, you know. I'm I'm just looking at the world's data, and you know, 10 million out of 50 million, um, 10 million volts are kind of in positive if they unwind that when PSM PSM is enabled, um, they should have a small profit. So maybe we see some unwinding. Um, and the second point is, it's, you know, it's really hard to judge because we don't know who is acquiring this, what's going to happen. But like I had this thought that. If somebody starts blacklisting um, USD at Maker tomorrow, um, you know the whole acquisition becomes worthless. Like um, you know the whole TUSD project is worthless. So maybe not not as worried. Um, but of course, if you know if something bad happens, we, we need a plan, and we need a plan before it happens. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with all the proposed um, um, scenarios. Like we could do it differently. Um, yeah, I mean, if you need to wait for liquidation 2.0, I think the, the one that Lev proposed where we adjust the flipper and set some kind of price where we will, we can actually measure what's going to be the cost for maker and what's going to be the benefit for, for keepers and the benefit's going to be higher because those worlds are, you know, they still have some additional value over 100%. And you know, we can pretty much know, you know, if you're going to attract uh, people to, to beat and we're, we're going to know what's our, what's our cost. Um, but the, the PSM idea also makes sense to me, especially if you're going to introduce other coins into PSM. Um, but yeah, if you want to get re rid of TUSD, I'm not sure if PSM TUSD solution is, is good, actually. Yeah, it's worth mentioning that, like, you know, no one's necessarily decided that we should get rid of, or that we need to get rid of TS, TUD, TS, TUSD, right? Like, that's a whole other debate. Like, we're talking about, like, a like, speculative risk at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, long. It's probably good to speak about this this type of plan and make them generic, not for for TUSD, but for any uh, collateral type that we might have uh, now or in the future, and make sure that we are ready and we have a a, a decent plan, uh, including communication, 
uh, to the vault holders. Um, yeah, just to just make sure that we can do this. Like just preparing for any type of emergency it doesn't mean that we need to pull the trigger after we we know the plan, right? Yep, that's and a very good point. Regulators are going to push even harder in 2021 and beyond. Um, stable coins can potentially provide an existential risk to the protocol uh, because of the blacklist risk. So uh, a lot of people think that that won't happen, but um, I mean there there are talks in process uh, that, that it might. Sorry to be the downer. And that's fine. That's a good good perspective, uh, Brian. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you and Juan are right. Right, we need to. It would be good to have some sort of um, plan in place to deal with uh, stable coin related issues. Just an idea. Sorry to interrupt, but maybe uh, at some point while we transition to the full DAO here, maybe somebody can come up with a MIP where we have a government relations person that works for the DAO. Uh, that way we are not, we're including the conversation with USDC and Paxos and everyone else. Are you looking for a job, Joe? I got enough already, but that's the, that, that's just uh, <laughs> um, excellent points that have been brought up. Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I'm half joking, but, but for sure we need to consider these things and have a, a plan, uh, MIP or not, but we need to have a, at least like some kind of guidelines that we need, uh, that we, well, that we know that it's there and, and that we can follow whenever this happens. Uh, but yeah, Brian has a great point that if stable coins are not only not awesome uh, because of the PR um, non benefits, but also because of the, of the regulations, right? So, but well, this might be a good time to start thinking about it. But I think there's, I still think they're going to be worked out okay. And uh, I think we're going to see explosion of growth next year in stable coins. Um, I think our biggest role is just being managed the risk on it all. And, um, you know, it's uh, yesterday, I suggest you all, I'm sorry to take over this little thing. Look at CNBC yesterday and look at the person who was head of the New York Federal Reserve, Glenn Hutchins, came out and said, stable coins are exploding and will continue to explode. They're great mechanisms for transferring of money. And this guy used to run the Federal Reserve in New York. It was on CNBC yesterday in the morning. Um, anyway, I just wanted to let everybody know that. Yeah, thanks, Joe. You're always welcome to, to comment. Um, yes, I think it'd be interesting seeing how the whole the whole space evolves in relation to regulations, um, especially when it, if it starts getting to a point where we're getting different regulations from different, um, you know, different like nations. It's going to get uh, interesting. I actually just well, I want to point out that there's a potential alternative to taking on stable coins in order to maintain the peg, which is to set up a structure kind of like the way Matt has with MIP21 to have a trust where we could potentially send dollars or send die with the express intent of that trust just selling the die and holding dollars in the bank account. I mean, at least that way, the beneficiary of that trust is the maker holders and there's no blacklist risk. Well, if you have dollars, you can be blacklisted by the government. I mean, sure, That's they the could issue. freeze them, but they, they would have to go through the legal, you know, the judicial system then. They wouldn't just be able to click a button. Yeah, I mean, the issue with stable coins is it's not so much the federal government or any government authority causing it. It's that Circle has the sole and absolute authority to do it by themselves at their sole discretion. Now, they do have recourse, and people have recourse if they do that. But it is up to them to decide to do that. The main issue, Greg, the main, if you, something like that could work. The challenge, however, would be you have, you know, there's the deposits are only insured up to X amount uh, with whatever FDIC. Now, there's an other aspect to that. The next follow on, which is if that, in that account 
had an investment advisor and then you were allowed to buy, for example, U.S. treasuries with it, then you've, you've taken it one step further where it's backed by basically U.S. treasuries at that point, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Uniswap LP tokens are going to help a lot too. We can put tokens in that are like USTC, USDT pairs, and they're both blacklistable on their own. Uh, it's possible that the Uniswap exchange could get blacklisted, but we can still extricate the tokens from our system and uh, they'll be dealt with in the greater DeFi ecosystem. Um, so there is a lot of access to liquidity there that's a lot safer for the protocol. Yeah, I, I see sort of a trend too, as uh, sort of protocols keep building on top of each other, this blacklist risk, it's gonna either turn into you blacklist all of DeFi or, and less about like blacklisting individual addresses. So like Circle will probably not want to like just ax all their, all DeFi uh, USDC. Um, and so I think we have some, we either all go down together or we all don't, uh, it's pretty bad like that would be like a death sentence for their currency. So oh, they, they've already done it once or twice, you know, under probably totally justified circumstances. And there are mechanisms. I mean, the whole avenue for putting forth real world assets is explicitly to help offset stable coins. I mean, one of the benefits of doing this kind of PSM model in general is we're going to know this is how much we need to displace constantly. We'll know with precision. Yeah. That's actually my favorite aspect of the PSM. Shows you the dollar amount you need to get back to peg. Yeah, that's actually how much supply you have to add. That's something I think is really cool as well, because there's the potential for using it for like algorithmic stability fee changes or something in the future as well. Like it's a on-chain source of data you could potentially use to automate things. Lots of problems with that other than that, but it's like a start, right? So we sort of tangentially moved off of the original topic, but um, is anyone, uh, does anyone have any other opinions about TUSD, its change of ownership, uh, and if Tron and possibly Justin Sun are in control of it? I don't know. Um, is, does anyone want to like go through the, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I was going to say I think Greg brought up really good points on the on the forum uh, about the the custody of the USD changing and the trustees for the banking relationships, and then the if the blacklisting function is going to go towards the so-called consortium. Um, and, and yeah, the date the date is probably what should give us a sense of urgency or not. Uh, I think that regardless, we should start working towards something, but. Uh, but the urgency is not clear right now. Oh, so we don't have a date yet. And no. This changes. Yeah, we don't. So Raphael, who's the CEO of Trust Token, said several weeks. Um, did ask him to be more specific, but this it's possibly just not allowed to be right. So we might not get an answer. I mean, Maker Maker is a risk protocol, right? Like we every token that we take on gives us some amount of risk and the idea is that we offset that with the stability fees that's the insurance uh premium right i mean we might decide that tusd the the risk premium is too high for anyone to to actually use it and then maybe at that point then we do have to delist it um but i don't think i don't think like we should completely throw this thing out um we just need to manage the risk now that the risk has changed yeah, we need a way to quantify supervillain risk. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would go one step further. I mean, I would, like if we just take the corollary of the central bank to a banking model, banks aren't allowed to change hands without previously giving consent or even receiving consent from a central bank. In this context, it happened without the consent. It's not because we, we have no way to demand that consent. Uh, Right now, if I'm looking at the numbers, you know, a party could decide to mint die based off of it. 
Um, and I agree what you just said about the risk parameters and, and the risk premium that'd be associated. But in parallel to that, I mean, I, I would, my personal vote would be to lower the debt ceiling immediately to inhibit taking on additional risk until we quantify that in parallel to potentially having to raise the stability fee. But like you mentioned earlier, if the stability, if the, if the TUSD that's outstanding is potentially already underwater, it's more of just potentially limiting the damage as much as possible. The, the debt ceiling is going to zero in the PSM vote. Correct. Got it. Yep, so that will be, I mean, on the other list, it'll be Friday, but potentially maybe more than Monday or Tuesday. Um, and that is making the assumption those two things pass in sequence. Yes. Yes, it is. You're right. Yeah, we are assuming the the regular uh, foundation constructed executive will pass, um, which is not guarantee, obviously. Hey, uh, with regards to the consortium of uh, uh, TUSD, would it be a vote of confidence if uh, 816Z stays on board? And also, um, Speaking of A16Z, uh, Horowitz got uh, named to the Coinbase Board of Directors. Um, so I think that's actually a vote of confidence for DAI, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, just wondering what you guys, what do you guys think about that if they stay on the consortium? I know they invested in TUSD, um, a few others, if that would be a plus sign. And, and what is their thinking be behind going to Tron? I mean, it would be nice to know, are they doing it because they just don't see the scalability in Ethereum and they want to go to Tron and maybe they're going to go to Algorand next? Like, you know, th these are questions that we just don't know yet, right? I mean, I think it's, <clears throat> I don't know about TUSD, but, or, or true, true token, but um, a lot of the other uh, st U.S. dollar-backed stablecoins are like shipping versions of their token on every other blockchain out there. So, like, I think the change of ownership is more than just them doing <laughs> doing a token for uh, Tron. But just seeing how other others act, right? Um, I know of of um, yeah, like quite a few other token projects in the Polkadot ecosystem, on Near, on and so on. So, Lucas, in your opinion, if, if A16Z sold their stake in uh, TUSD, how do you view that? I, <clears throat> I don't think I wouldn't. I wouldn't really. Um, I wouldn't really weigh that much, to be honest, because like most of these VC funds, like don't actively manage their portfolio, and certainly, like if they write off a project, they wouldn't care about even necessarily trying to sell it uh, of course maybe they would but i mean i don't know i've uh, just because of certain vc fund sells or doesn't sell i mean they've done a bunch of other bad investments um, like v generally like vcs and, and then and then still own these tokens right so i think that's not a vote of confidence or or not a vote of confidence Cool. All right. I think if uh, no one has anything to add, we'll think about ending the call uh, here. Um, last chance, anyone wants anything they want to get out? Okay. Well, no one's, no one's shouting over me. Uh, so <laughs> um, I'll just go through a last couple of few reminders. Um, again, maybe any of this meeting won't happen next week. Um, there won't be any. Uh, governance, there aren't really any weekly governance uh, actions either, so no polls, no executives, um, with the exception of the, the PSM executive um, being managed by Sam. Um, and then again, when this call comes back in the new year, it will be at the slightly later time of 1700 US uh, UTC, not USD, we're talk talking too much about stablecoins. Um, so yeah, I think that's everything. Is there any other last points anyone else wants to make? Reminders or such. 
if anybody wants to wish wish each other happy holidays now's a good time yeah when's well, the christmas party <laughs> I don't think it doesn't sound like we're having a, having a Christmas party. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do, do wish you all. I, I mean, I brought my hat. I don't, I don't know what you guys are. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, Chris is the heart and soul of the Christmas party right now. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, I will just, I guess I'll just end by saying it's, you know, it's been a pleasure talking to you all uh, in these meetings over the last year. Um, I hope you all have great holidays um, and hope to see you all again. Happy and healthy in the new year. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Yep. Uh, happy holidays, everyone. See you in the next year. <laughs>